Hi everybody, my name is Misha Ann Martin and I am the Director of People Analytics here at WorkHuman. I lead the portion of the WorkHuman IQ team that is client facing. So we bring analytics from the rest of the WorkHuman IQ team to the client and we also do our own analytics for the client as well. So we do some of the analytics, we collaborate with others on the WorkHuman IQ team, uh, but essentially we're responsible for bringing analytics to our clients. It's a comfort level with being your authentic self at work. That means feeling like even if you're different, that's okay and the organization will not only accept that, but embrace it as well. And it means that you can speak up and give your ideas and make a mistake even without any kinds of negative consequences that would prevent you from doing things like that in the future. Fortunately, the research has been really clear on this master of psychological safety. Google was really at the forefront of doing this research and they have a stellar research team that is credible and well known for the work they do. And so they embarked on this research project called Project Aristotle and they were trying to figure out what makes a team really effective. And they studied over a hundred attributes to try to find out. And they found out that the most important predictor of team effectiveness was in fact psychological safety. Even given all the talent that Google hires and you know how good they are at hiring very talented people, they found that it didn't as much matter who was on the team. It was about how the team interacted with each other and psychologically safe teams were really the best at getting things done. So that study really showed us that psychological safety is important for team effectiveness. But also if you think about it, if everyone feels comfortable contributing, that definitely increases innovation and increases the performance and productivity of each individual as well. So from day one, the experiences of someone who's working in a place that is psychological, psychologically safe it's gonna be de very different than someone who's working in a place that is not. So for the place that is safe, you know, that organization is going to focus on what the onboarding experience is like. They are going to do things to make sure the person feels welcome, right? So they're going to try to surprise and delight um, the same way that people do with customers that they want to keep and, and impress. The organization will literally be trying to impress the individual. That individual will have a leader that will encourage them to ask questions. They'll check in frequently to see how they're doing, to see if they feel supported. That leader will focus on a relationship with the person. That leader will attempt to connect by being vulnerable first so that they can set the tone and encourage the person to say the same. See, when you're new, um, that's when it's especially important to say, hey, I'm not sure about this, or I don't know this, or I need more information. A good leader in a psychologically safe environment will be on the lookout for that and will let people literally know that it's okay to tell me if you need more information on something or if you're not feeling quite sure. As the experience moves on, let's say we get six months down the line, you know, the person in a psychologically safe environment should feel energized. They should feel like my unique skills are valued here. When I, when I go into a meeting and I have an idea, I can share it. That person should wake up with a smile on their face, eager to go to work. They should start thinking about work in the shower in a good way, not dreading work. And they will likely have a good long career at that particular place. They might even move from department to department as they learn more and they contribute more. They should be able to feel like they can be their whole selves at work and talk about their family. Now, Speaking of the person who's in the non-psychologically safe environment, when that person starts, the organization will likely focus on what they need from the person and not necessarily what the person needs from them. So you're talking things like compliance, right? Like we need the I-9 done. We need you to do all this training. Here's a checklist. Go sit over there in the corner and do your training and tell us when you're done. Here's your badge. Here's your Computer, not saying that those things are not important, but those things in the absence of an experience communicates quite early on to the employee that what's most important to us is not who you are and what you experience, but what you can produce for us. 
here are the tools for us to get what we need from you, right? The manager will give task lists instead of and in the absence of like real conversations about how the person is doing. They won't check in on things other than goals and tasks and deliverables. And as the person matures in their tenure, what's gonna start to happen is they will probably feel burned out. You know, they'll feel like, okay, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work, but I'm not really having a lot of fun. So that person will likely wake up with dread, you know, and really not want to be at that place anymore because they will feel only as important to the organization as what they produce. So those are kinds of the differences in experience between someone who works at a place that's psychologically safe and someone who does it. I am at the point in my career where I feel more psychologically safe than I ever have before. I have a natural hairstyle now and that's new for me. And at first I was terrified and now I kind of don't care, you know, and it's, it's, it's liberating and people compliment me on it. And I'm still in a space where I'm like, oh, people like this and it's okay. Because remember, not so long ago, you know, um, people were saying that certain types of hairstyles were unprofessional and a lot of Afrocentric hairstyles were considered <laughs> unprofessional. You know, I wear bright colors. I talk about my personal story and I would say within the past year or so, I've come to realize that talking about my personal experiences and marrying that with research and data is really a powerful thing. It requires vulnerability, but it's been really, really rewarding so far, you know, just being my whole self and it feels different and I kind of like it. So yes, I am proud to say that I have experienced that. I am experiencing that right now. I'm a big fan of if you want to know something about how people feel, you should just ask. And so there are lots of good questions out there around psychological safety, questions that you can include on your survey around authenticity, around feeling like your opinion is valued, feeling like you can make a mistake without negative consequences. So there are things that you can ask in your regular employee listening program. The other thing you can do is observe. So some of the things I mentioned before, if you notice in meetings that only few people are speaking and those people tend to be men, that's probably a sign that your organization may not be completely psychologically safe for women. If women talk about their kids and what they need to do with their kids or they need to leave early and someone rolls their eyes, that's another good marker. So I would recommend that people ask and that people observe as well. I think in order to, you know, make improvements, you have to know exactly where you need to improve. So the first step is to identify what the specific gap is. And then the next step is to figure out why is there a gap? What are the things about our culture that make people feel that way? What are the things we can try and implement and then measure again to see if that you know, initiative or whatever you did to improve that actually worked. No one was prepared for a pandemic, right? The last time this happened was what, 1918? And nobody was expecting this to happen right now. So in a sense, when it happened and we all had to figure out how to keep doing the things that we were doing in terms of work, companies kind of said, oh, we don't really know how to do this. And we're really open about it. And so that was a kind of vulnerability. Look at all the innovation that came out of that. Look at all the different things we figured out in terms of getting work done, drinking alcohol. I don't know if you guys got those cocktails to go, exercise classes, all these things we just figured out. And so I feel like that is a really great lesson that we can take moving forward that will contribute positively, positively to psychological safety. Part of human connection is that vulnerability and putting yourself out there and saying, I don't know, and I'm not sure, because then what happens is people feel like they can reciprocate and do the same. So if organizations keep that same idea and that same sentiment, instead of going back to how we were in the past where, you know, organizations were a little paternalistic, we know what's best, right? I think that we can move forward in a way where everyone can contribute to whatever it is we're trying to solve. And that is psychological safety in essence, where everybody can contribute. 
there's a whole body of uh, social psychology research around human relationships. And what it tells us is that good things happen when we take down these walls and we're vulnerable because it allows other people to do the same thing. And that is how you form connection and trust. And when you start from a foundation of trust, very, very good things happen. And people just feel comfortable and they relax. And that is, you know, when you feel like you can really speak up and say what you wanna say and be who you wanna be. But I have seen lots of new leaders, um, you know, do what they think a leader is supposed to do and kind of posture up. And that is the opposite of what you want to do. You really want to posture down and connect with people authentically because that's how you inspire people and that's how they trust you. And that's how you get ideas that are better than what you originally came up with. That's what leadership is. Yes, I started to notice this within the pandemic. And frankly, you know, at that point, I was in a lot of Facebook groups that were um, created by black women for black women. And I started to hear people express a sense of relief at not going into the office anymore. It's kind of like, you know, you, um, develop this metaphorical mask in order to fit in and be professional. And you're just kind of holding yourself together to meet this standard. That's not really you and has nothing to do with how well you can do your work. And so when people started to go remote, I started to feel this metaphorical like, okay, now I can kind of be myself. And I think that now that people have had a taste for that, I mean, I'm hearing people say, I don't have to deal with the microaggressions anymore. I don't have to pretend to this or that or whatever it is, right? And so people that are feeling relief, I don't think they're going to want to go back to what they were dealing with before. So we're at this point in time where we should have addressed a lot of this stuff before. But I think now we really, really have to because our intention of getting people into the office, at least some of the time, and creating a space that is inclusive, those two things are going to collide and not happen together unless we really address psychological safety, in my opinion. There are some for sure telltale signs in an organization that indicate that it might not be very psychological safe, psychologically safe for everybody. So I like to think of, for example, those companies where everybody looks the same, you know, where they wear, where they wear the uniform, right? So companies where people are allowed to express themselves, you see people in different styles, maybe people in tattoos, people with different color hair, or, you know, you may go to a meeting and you have a lot of people in attendance in the meeting, but only a few people speaking. And then as you go to a lot of different meetings, you notice that the same few people are speaking every time. So those are kind of some telltale signs that maybe, you know, authenticity is not as valued as it is elsewhere, you know, and not everyone is encouraged to speak up. When somebody speaks up and disagrees, you may have experienced this in your career, but sometimes you just hear dead silence. Like people can't, can't believe that someone disagreed with so-and-so or someone disagreed at all. That's for sure a sign. Or if somebody says something and somebody uh, makes a joke of it, that's not quite a joke. I don't know if you've experienced that. I've kind of seen that around too. Uh, those are some subtle signs that those behaviors are not quite okay in that context. I think humor is okay, but sometimes there is a caustic edge to it where you know that it's not quite funny. It's supposed to tell you that you weren't supposed to say that. There's a subtle difference, but you can for sure feel it. I hope that you've never had this experience, but you might have before, where some team leaders are frankly a little bit lazy and their direct reports ask them why, or they ask them for context and they get irritable and impatient and they say, just do it. I'll just tell you what to do and just do it. And this is the date I need it done by. That is a terrible practice. That tells the individual that it's not okay to ask questions. It's not okay to contribute. All that they need to do is just get stuff done and not use their mind. So that is probably the worst practice I can think of in terms of how somebody can lead in a way that says, you're not safe here. Like people aren't really 
screwing caps on toothpaste anymore as much as they used to be, right? Like we've come past that as a society and we know that the human mind is a wonderful thing. And if people can use their minds and really ask questions and contribute, then it's good for the human, it's good for society, it's good for business, it's good for innovation, it's good for productivity. In psychologically safe environments, people are very comfortable saying what they need. And our research tells us that there are certain people who are lower on that. So women are lower on psychological safety, parents, and marginalized populations. So people in the U.S. who are not white. And so what this suggests to me, let's look at parents for a minute, right? So parents need flexibility, uh, even people with uh, taking care of elders, right? They need flexibility to deal with the things that come up with their families. So back to your example, you know, the idea of being accessible all the time, if an individual is not feeling that or can't do that or doesn't want to do that for whatever reason, and they speak up and say that, the organization, if they are a psychologically safe environment, should adjust accordingly, right? And respect those boundaries that the person has has set. So the person should feel comfortable speaking up and saying, you know, this is not okay. This is not working for me. And the organization should really accept that. Because, you know, people are different. Some people like that. But if you don't, you should be able to say, hey, not not good for me. And the organization should respect that. They should love that you spoke up and said something and they should not punish you. But again, that's, you know, when you require people to work all those hours and you're not giving people the option to say, this is not good for me you are sending a message that the individual is only as important to you as how much they can produce. That is very different from an environment that says, you're a human and we respect that. What does this human need, right? We want this whole human to be okay. We value you more than what you can do for us and we're really invested in making sure you're healthy, whatever that means for you. There is one particular thing, you know, I think it's always worth worth it to try if people don't feel like speaking up when there are people of higher authority, you know, or higher on the org chart in the room. One simple thing you can do is when there's a question asked or when uh, brainstorming is happening, the most senior person speaks last. That's something that can be done to make sure that people know that, hey, we don't have to go with whatever that person says. Let's go ahead and hear from everybody in the room. So, you know, simple things like that can really change the environment or even, you know, the hand raising feature in Zoom, right? That gives everybody the opportunity to say, hey, I have something to say. And it can be a little bit easier than interrupting or trying to come in cold. So some of these, um, you know, tactical things around how you run meetings and how you encourage people to contribute can potentially make a really big difference. Our research is very clear on the link between recognition and psychological safety. We did a survey just earlier this year, so a few months ago, and what we found is that the people who were recognized most recently reported the highest levels of psychological safety. And that makes sense because really when you are disciplined and detailed with recognition and you say to an individual, hey, these are the things that I appreciate about you. This specific thing that you did I really appreciate it, and here's why it meant a lot to me. That is really a way to say to an individual, I see you, and it's a really good way to let people know that the human is important here. The entire authentic you, we see that, and we appreciate that. So, you know, it's nice that the research reinforces that because conceptually that makes all the sense to me. But people are coming around, and it's so nice to see. I went to a webinar a few months ago where um, an individual did an experiment where they took a screenshot of the entire Zoom screen before and then they gave a particular person a compliment and took a screenshot right after. And when you see the differences in the faces, I mean, you can try it in your personal life. You know what I mean? I know that that I have um, after meeting Global Force and Brenda came and she spoke to my group of people, you know, 
And she really talked about the power of recognition. I just started trying it at work and with my people. And even now when I say, hey, you know, I tell this person this certain thing about you, but I don't know if I've ever said to you that I appreciate this particular thing about you. And then you look at your loved one's face and it's like, it's it's really nice. It's kind of this self-reinforcing thing, right? So it keeps you doing it. It's nice. There are a uh, few things I recommend and that I do myself. I think one of the good things to do is to let employees own their check-in so that they understand that it's their time to get what they need from you. And also send a clear message that blending the personal and the professional in this meeting is quite fine because it's your meeting. Whatever you need out of this meeting, you will get. If you need clarity on a work task, you will get that. If you wanna talk about your weekend, we can do that too. If you wanna go for a walk, you know. So I think giving the employee agency, and so it's not just here's what I need from you, but it's more of a, okay, this is your time and I'm here to support you, how can I do that? I think that's a good best practice. Um, I've also interjected some fun into my check-ins. So a few years back, I did some research on which employee engagement survey questions were most predictive of turnover intentions. And one of the questions that was most predictive was something about manager, my manager knowing about the barriers that I face. And ever since I did that, I started doing what I call best of worst of in my check-ins. And I've been doing that for a few years now across a few different companies. And it's essentially, what's the best thing about your week? What's the worst thing about your, your week? And also what's the best thing you ate this week? Cause, cause that's fun. And for best of worst of people can either choose something personal or something professional. And because I've done it over a few companies now and you know, kind of used it to get to know my direct reports, it's very interesting. People tend to start out with professional things. You know, Here's the best thing that happened to me this week at work. Here's the worst thing that happened at work. The worst thing that happened at work is very important because that is the barrier that I can then try to remove. That's worked really well. But also, you can start to also see the relationship develop and they start to put personal things in there. You know, especially when I do that because I also do best of worst of and reciprocate. So it's been really, really helpful for me and my relationships with my direct reports. What people feel affects what they do. And what you do at work is your performance. And so the bottom line is psychological safety affects how people feel. If you feel, if you're in an environment where you feel uncomfortable, where you feel like you're not accepted, where you feel like your ideas are not important, there's no way that you're performing at your best. When humans are not okay, they're very um, self-focused and hesitant. So think about an organization that has a customer so when somebody is psychologically safe and they feel good, they're more likely to be smiling. Let's just take it to the base, base level. How do customers feel when somebody smiles at them? They're not as self-focused, right? They're thinking about what the customer needs because they've had their personal needs met, right? So they're better customer service professionals. They're better to their colleagues. They're better to their families, by the way. You know, like when you feel good, it just colors your whole life in the most positive way. When you're asking humans to do things, it is important for humans to feel good so that they can do those things well. So that translates to better performance at an individual level and collectively better performance at an organizational level as well. I think that now is the time for us to rethink all our old assumptions about work and to put down these walls between personal and professional. We made all these rules that make no sense, that make a lot of individuals less comfortable in general and feel like it's less okay to be authentic. We need to do away with some of that, you know? Like um, the way we dress for work or what's considered appropriate ha hair or all these, all these random silly things that we told ourselves were important. And I think that once we start to take down those barriers, people will really start to feel more comfortable being authentic and I think good things will happen.